All right, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is LP, and I'm the owner and co-founder of Focus on Health, which is such a weird thing to say. Um, I'm just really excited to have Drea here today, um, who's someone that really uh, assisted and guided me uh, in the beginning of my career. And it's, it's just really lovely to have her be a part of what we're um, doing today. So for those of you who do not know Focus on Health, we are a platform that advocates for the health and wellness of the food and beverage sector. Um, it's been a really beautiful year working with a, a variety of humans, uh, both in the industry and outside of the industry, to really just create programs and opportunities for individuals looking to, to take a hold of their health. Um, so for Women's History Month um, and last month, we have been working with Speedrack for their Speedrack Academy sessions that really focus on themes throughout the entirety of the month. Um, what we do is we work with industry professionals to teach uh, classes associated with cocktail demos on topics that really resonate with them. Um, and this week is a woman in ownership. And Drea's got a little bit of a twist that I'm really excited for her to teach today. So uh, without further ado, I will let her take it away. Awesome. Thanks, LP. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited uh, to be a part of this series. Uh, hello, I'm Andrea Tediosian, and um, I hope that everyone swiped right on the, um, not on Tinder, not necessarily on Tinder, but on the, um, the Instagram post about this, because if you didn't get the, uh, the details about the seminar, I know it's called Women and Ownership, but the subtext is it's owning it, but not literally, because I myself do not own, have never owned a bar or a restaurant. Um, I don't even own a car. I've got a beat up Vespa and that's about it. But, uh, and this crazy puppy that I'm sure will make an appearance. Uh, but, yeah. But in terms of ownership, I want to talk about owning your growth, owning your own progress, and then taking ownership in your own community. Um, it's something that is very near and dear to my heart as I've spent several years uh, doing being a part of several initiatives and groups and organizations in DC. And uh, I'm very grateful for the community here because it's extremely supporting, um, supportive rather. And uh, it makes it really easy to, um, to feel comfortable taking a piece of it and pushing it in a direction that you want to see it. So we'll be getting into that, but we can, oh, I'm sure you saw the tail. Um, but yeah, we can jump right into the slides. So yes, taking ownership of your growth and taking initiative within your community. So next, we'll do a very brief bio. Um, just the who, what, and where's. So as I said, I'm Andrea Tediosian. Uh, I am president of the DC Craft Bartenders Guild, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, for a shining 10 weeks, I was the lead bartender at Silver Lion. We had uh, five weeks of training and we were open for five weeks and then we got fur furloughed. So very much looking forward to jumping back in there. Um, but currently I am assistant editor for The Blend it is my part-time job uh, during this pandemic situation. I'm located in Washington, DC. And I've been bartending in DC since bartending in DC and otherwhere, otherwhere, wow, other places <laughs> since about 2010 until the present. And by bartending in the present, that's basically the setup you see here and not much else. Uh, so next, we're gonna jump into a little bit about the DC Craft Bartenders Guild uh, because it does uh, it, it does have a very big impact for my trajectory when it comes to taking ownership. Uh, it is an independent bartender skill that was established in 2007 by uh, 10 bartenders in DC, 10 friends who wanted to spread their love of craft cocktails. Uh, for anyone who is uh, Gen Z in the group, you may not know this, but in 2007, 
uh, resources on craft cocktails and classic cocktails and history and distillation were few and far between. And so these 10 friends got together and decided that they wanted to, um, to spread the education and spread the love. So from those 10 friends, it grew to over 235 members in the DC area, a uh, few members in Maryland and Virginia as well which makes us the largest independent bartenders guild in the USA. So I know that the um, USBG is just a, a huge organization with many chapters and a lot of those chapters uh, have much more than 235 members. But the fact that we're an, or an independent guild actually gives me an opportunity as the current president and as a member, frankly, to really help push it in a direction. Um, by being an independent bartender's guild, you can um, you can really uh, you don't have to answer to anyone in terms of like higher ups. Like you can make decisions right here on the ground for yourself. So uh, our focus right now has been education, community engagement, competitions, um, and the DC Repeal Day Ball, which is along with the I, I got to give props to the Tampa Bay USBG chapter, um, the Tampa Bay chapter of the USBG uh, for also throwing a huge repeal day ball uh, between Tampa Bay and us. Uh, they're probably the two biggest celebrations of the repeal of prohibition in the country. Um, so exciting stuff. And next, so owning it sounds easier said than done. Um, there are a lot of questions and a lot of doubts I think that younger bartenders in particular may have in terms of taking the next step, uh, taking charge of something, going from uh, you know, just learning to actually implementing what they've learned. And for me, the biggest question has been this, and click, how to overcome fear of failure and just make cool shit happen. And unfortunately, we're not, there's no catch-all answer for this. But on the next slide, there's part of it. And I know it's not helpful. Roll up your sleeves and get to work. I know, it's, it sounds like the most annoying, obvious, unhelpful piece of advice. But we'll get into it a little bit later. Um, and if you click, We'll see the number one question is where do you even start when you're trying to take ownership in your community, when you're trying to own your own growth, um, where do you start when you're trying to start something new? And the answer is click, you start small. I hope you can see this on your screen because I can't. You start small, you have to start somewhere. Um, you know, looking at speed rack today, as an example, if you've, never if you're just jumping into bartending and you just hear about speed rack today it sounds like um it's always been this global giant amazing uh competition that also includes all of these seminars but lynette and uh and ivy started smaller and then they slowly grew it to where it is today so we're going to get into that starting point on the next slide so for me I'm gonna tell story time. Here's my little anecdote. Um, broken ankle leads to a seismic shift. It sounds like a terrible movie trailer, I know, but bear with me. And so click, in 2015, I was invited to bartend at the DC Repeal Day Ball. I had a table, which was a big honor. Uh, you, could, you got to be featured in front of all of your peers. And uh, there were cocktails, they were of the craft variety, and the crutches part was a bartender in our community came up to me um, and she had broken her ankle. And she said, you know, I'm having, I'm having a lot of trouble paying rent. Um, I'm worried that if I, if I don't come up with money that I won't be able to pay this or next month's rent, I'm really concerned. And then if you click, she mentioned that she had asked several people uh if they could help her if they could put together a fundraiser she was dealing with medical bills and rent she asked a lot of people who said yes but then never followed through 
And so if you click, I just said, sure. I don't know what I, I don't know what I'll do, but I'll help. And so on the next slide, I'd never thrown a fundraiser. Um, this was before, this was like right around the time GoFundMe was becoming a thing. Um, and I didn't really know where to start. So next, basically I just, um, I looked at it in terms of what do I have, what does anyone have to lose by me trying something new here? Um, but by me trying to help, you know, worst comes to worst, we raise a hundred dollars for her and that's a hundred dollars more than, uh, more than she would have had. So uh, the low risk in terms of not worrying and not having a ton of pressure besides just raising money, it made it a lot easier for me for the first time to take de decisive action, to make those decisions. Um, you know, instead of freaking out over the details and worrying, what about this date? What about this venue? What about this time? There was urgency and there was no action happening. So um, it was easy, easy to make moves from there. Um, never having done it before, I enlisted people who had experience. I asked them for advice on how to throw, throw an event. I asked them for advice on how to get donations. I used the existing network I had in DC to get the word out, to get people to attend and uh, share the GoFundMe. And I made it fun. You don't want to show up to a fundraiser and have it be a bummer. It needs to be fun. So little by little, we made a fundraiser happen. Next. And we can go to the next slide. And, and we can click again. Sorry, I have some animation. I got a little fancy. And so by taking that one step, I got completely hooked to making shit happen. It was that easy. It was reaching out to people, um, throwing a party, which I loved to do. And all I had to do was just make it start somewhere and just make it happen. So that's why the cocktail we're gonna make now is the self-starter. So if you click, we've got the recipe that I'll be making right here. Um, and I had to, of course, include a quote from Hamilton, got a lot farther by working a lot harder by being a lot smarter by being a self-starter by 14, they placed him in charge of a training charter. So I love that quote. And I also love the self-starter as a cocktail. Um, so it's going to be the first one that I'm going to make right now. Open my Citadel gin here. Uh, so this Cocktail was in Harry Craddock's uh, Savoy Cocktail Book from 1930. Uh, Harry Craddock was the lead bartender at the time. And actually his predecessor, Ada Coleman, was one of the most legendary female bartenders of all time. Um, but we'll talk about Harry just for the sake of this cocktail. Um, this is one of my favorite martini variations uh it's light it's extremely refreshing and oh, nope haven't worked in mills for a while <laughs> right i was trying to do this the other day we so we used to work at silver line together and Britt, who's here as well and i was like what are mills <laughs> i i picked up a couple of shifts at Bresca during restaurant week and they used mills and i was really excited and really scared so I don't know what I just saw, but Brent said, going. get that double jigger life together. <laughs> Bro, the pandemic, whatever. Um, so I'll convert to, <laughs> to ounces. Um, it's 45 mils or an ounce and a half of Citadel gin, 30 mils of Koki Americano, uh, which is about an ounce and 15 mils or about a half ounce of apricot liqueur. Um, the original cocktail recipe calls for it to be shaken, um, but we're not going to do that because, uh, because no, I'm not sure 
the original uh, reasoning for that, but we're gonna go ahead and stir our cocktail. And then ordinarily our cocktail glasses would be chilled at this point, but um, like I said, pandemic bartending at home. So give this a nice stir. And because it's freezer ice, I'm not gonna stir it for that long. And then we'll just spritz the glass with a little absinthe and strain it. My mouth is watering as you're straining that. <laughs> one of my all time favorite like classics. I wouldn't say it's like a complete unknown. I know that um, I think it, it, it regained popularity primarily at Rain's Law Room in New York. Um, but just outside of that, I don't see it really on menus or that much. But uh, yes, this is a, a self starter. So cheers to being a self-starter and taking ownership of our shit. Cheers. Mm. I love that. I'm a sucker for stone fruit. It's just. <laughs> I, I see a lot of nods. Everyone agrees. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. <laughs> um, but yes, let's, let's jump back to story time. So uh, throwing that fundraiser, we actually were able to um, we were able to raise like a month and a half of rent for her. We threw a big party um, and it went great. And the assistance that I got from the community was really what gave me the confidence to continue, um, you know, continue pushing forward and trying new things and trying to make shit happen. Um, so the takeaways that I got from the actual Yes, so the aftermath. So after that event, I just, I was hooked. So I started taking on more responsibilities. Um, I ended up coordinating a May Day party at the bar I worked at. They gave me a $250 decorating budget and said, do whatever. And I built a Maypole and we threw a really fun party. Um, I ended up getting involved with the charity committee through the DC Craft Bartenders Guild. Uh, for brevity's sake, I'm just gonna refer to it as the Guild for the rest of the um, for the rest of this, uh, this seminar. Um, I ended up becoming the chair of the volunteer, of the charity committee rather. And we threw some really fun events, um, one of which was a Friendsgiving that we did in conjunction with the USBG in DC. Uh, which was a week of volunteer opportunities. And then everyone who volunteered got to come to a Friendsgiving uh, party, which was really lovely and really fun. Um, during one of our meetings, the president at the time of the guild asked for volunteers to take care of decoration for the repeal day ball. And no one was raising their hands. And so I raised my hand, I said, fuck it. And I ended up taking that on and it was a lot of fun, a lot of spray painting in backyards, a lot of uh, thrift shopping. It was a blast. And eventually all of that, um, you know, with me getting more and more involved in little things, I ended up running for the president and I won in 2016. Uh, after that, or rather after that event, I started saying yes to more opportunities to network and learn from other people and just be involved in the community. So I started attending seminars. I applied to more competitions because at the very least, they're a learning opportunity. Um, I applied to work at different, <laughs> fuck it, yeah. I mean, listen, it's a, it's a pandemic. If you want to go for something, now's the damn time to go for it. So yes, fuck it, go for it. <laughs> um, I started applying to uh, to work cocktail conferences, and I became a regular attendant attendee at uh, guild meetings, making lots of connections and ending up having a lot of fun. I started volunteering more in the community. Um, our friend in DC, Rachel Sergi put on a, uh, a homecoming party to bring together 
the Independent Guild of Baltimore and DC. I ended up volunteering with that, acted a fool, became homecoming queen unexpectedly. And I would work more tables at fundraisers. So all of these little things really just involved saying yes to more opportunities, even if they didn't seem like they were directly pushing me in a direction or further. Um, it was just, sure, let me help. Let me be a part of this. Let me learn from this. And so if we go to the next slide, um, I think it's the takeaways. So my long-term takeaways, the first one, and you can click, start somewhere, start anywhere. I had never had any experience throwing an event and I just said yes. And it was a small thing, but it was really important in the long term for me to take that first step to just take responsibility, take, you know, own something and make it happen and push for it to happen. Um, that was a great, it was really, really important in ways that I never would have predicted at the time. Then we can go next. Don't, now this was huge for me. I don't know if anyone else uh, worries a lot about messing up or failure. Again, it was mentioned in the beginning of the seminar, but don't let the pursuit of perfection stop you from making things happen. Uh, sometimes the fear of not doing everything exactly the way it should be can emotionally and mentally and sometimes physically be paralyzing. Um, it's really important for me anyway, to remind myself and just be okay with the fact that things are not going to be perfect. For anyone who was on the call uh, on this seminar at the very beginning, my dog knocked over my phone. These things happen and you roll with it. You have to roll with things. Don't, you know, don't let the, the fact that I don't have a perfect, uh, you know, home bar set up or whatever, stop me from taking opportunities. And then next, ask for advice without hesitation. Um, there are so many people in this industry who, if they haven't been exactly where you're trying to go or helped or done exactly what you're trying to do, they still can provide some sort of guidance. And most of them are more than happy to. Um, it's not necessarily, I know the word mentorship is thrown around a lot and uh, you know that's, that's a different conversation for me, but just asking for advice and reaching out and just saying, hey, I've never done this before. Any tips? You know, be specific in what you're asking about don't ask for someone to plan or build something from scratch for you. But, um, you know, reaching out to people, I didn't have any brand contacts that I really utilized before I did that event. Um, asking around helped. And the next, don't wait for anyone to tell you that you can take the lead, just do it. So if anyone that's on this call is waiting for a ray from heaven to come down and someone to tell you, you can lead, yes, it is your time. You are capable. Um, consider, consider this your sign. Consider this your sign from wherever. You can do it. It's as scary as it might seem, I promise. It's not that hard. It's not that hard to throw a fundraiser or to change someone's life or to throw a competition that, that leads to education. It's really, you just have to do it. I know it, it may not sound helpful, I'm sorry, but it's the reality. And then finally, a leader doesn't ask for permission. I love that, yes. Or, or approval. Leaders shouldn't need approval. And if you plan it, they will come. If as, and this is specific to events or competitions or seminars such as this, if you plan it and you plan well, people will come. People want to come 
to events and fundraisers and people want to come to seminars to learn, if you do it, it will happen. I, and let me, let me uh, preface, well not preface, but let me follow that by saying literally every event I've ever thrown in my life, down to five minutes before door, I am mentally freaking out that no one will come. Doesn't, and it's just how my brain works. It doesn't matter how many tickets were sold. It doesn't matter how many times, how many people liked it on social media, how many times it was shared. Um, that, you know, that, that worry that what you're doing, that your passion isn't resonating with other people, it's real, it's valid, and don't let it stop you. So next, trying to remember what order I did slides. Ah, yes, we're gonna go to our next cocktail. Um, I'm super excited because this is the second cocktail where the lyrics just really work. I'm not, I, I can't really see it from, uh, from my distance, but LP, do you wanna wrap this one? Do you wanna, do you wanna say the, uh, <laughs> the Len lyrics? I can definitely try. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to say it like a poem y'all. Yeah. And of, <laughs> and of course you can't become, if you, if you only say what you would have done. So I missed a million miles of fun. I know what's up for me. If you steal my sunshine. Yeah. I'm really, interested. I'm realizing as I was saying it as a poem, that's definitely not the way it goes. So I apologize <laughs> for butchering that y'all. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Um, any of you like 90s babies, I'm sorry from the bottom of my heart if you haven't heard this song before. Um, just the one hit wonder of it all. It's too good. So um, if you click, we're gonna get to the point of me putting a Len lyric in there, which is I'm going to make a sunshine daiquiri. Um, as I learned a couple of years ago, sunshine is a style of cocktail. You can make a sunshine whiskey sour, you can make a sunshine Collins. Um, it's kind of like a regal in that you're shaking it with something uh, with something in the shaker. So this sunshine daiquiri is such because we're going to be shaking it with a lime wedge in the shaker. It's going to add a little bit more juice, a little bit of the aroma from the oil as well. So normally I will make my classic daiquiri with a little bit less syrup. But because we're adding a little bit more lime, we upped it to 20 mils. So I'm gonna get started with 50 mils of Plantation Three Stars. Like seriously, has anyone is anyone unfamiliar with the song? Because I it's it's one that I just love to hate. It's a very like cruising in your mom's car. Like during the summer, like you get to go to the beach. I don't know. I, I have feelings about the song. It makes me rem remember what it's like to be like young and stupid. <laughs> no, it's so great. As I was saying it, I was like, I'm singing this in my head, but I'm saying it out loud. And that's why I can't say it as a poem. It's tripping me up. <laughs> <laughs> somebody um asked, oh, some, not somebody, Brit asked, uh, there is a tiny bit of bitterness from the Rhine, yeah? There is, um, but because we're shaking it and not like muddling it and make or making an oleo, the contact is really quick. Um, so it doesn't get that bitter. Um, you mostly, I mostly get the, um, the aroma from the oils. Here we go. And usually, usually I'll use um, a sixth of a lime, but the lime that I got today was brick and gigantic it was just monster lime so I'm using an eighth and yeah just toss it in the shaker and go to town at least it's not a DC lemon because you know those lemons have like a million seeds oh my god yep <laughs> I'm gonna shake to the beat. Oh, that just made me smile so hard. <laughs> oh, god damn it. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, I had to play it. <laughs> yep, you're all welcome. There you go. <laughs> uh, ordinarily, I would double strain my Dax, but um, I had to use a strainer to make the gum syrup and I haven't washed it yet. So we're making it work at home as we do. Nice little sunshine daiquiri, plantation three stars. Cheers, fam. Thanks for putting up with my musical choice. Mm. I'm here for it. It looks like we all are. We're still here. We're, we're in it. We're committed. We're in it. It. <laughs> Everyone's like, yes, Len. It's okay. Listen, I admitted my love for Len. You can do the same. Don't be scared. It's fine. But yes, this is, I, I love a sunshine anything, like a sunshine sherry daiquiri with like a little bit of salt, like my favorite. But yes, like we can, uh, we can move forward from here, uh, go to the next slide. Um, so I will admit the ends of this, um, of this presentation will jump around a skosh, um, cause I do want to talk about a little bit of self growth ownership. And I know that we've been talking a lot about events and making things happen in your community. So we're gonna finish it off uh, talking about um, events and fundraisers and making shit happen for your community and talk about the thing that, you know, we're gonna say the quiet part out loud. Capital concerns. Anyone who's a fan of Parks and Rec can hear this meme. Money, please. So how do you make shit happen with no money? Well, go to the next slide. We're gonna talk about our friends, the brands. Brands are wonderful. Brands are great. Brands want to be involved in cool shit. They do. They wanna be involved in the competition you're throwing. It, they wanna be present at events. They can be involved in some fundraisers and cannot in others, uh, it really depends. You know, brands want to be out there and they want to be in the community and they want to, like, frankly, they just want to be a part of cool shit. So you can reach out to them. Brand managers want you to reach out to them. They want to hear your ideas, the opportunities you have to partner. I just had a brand uh, manager call me the other day and ask, what do you need? What does, what does the guild need? What, what can we do for you? And if you have some ideas, you can just come up with stuff, come up with really fun events, come up with a competition, come up with ways to, to work with them. Uh, I saw Rachel, uh, Rachel say, yes, we do. Um, you know, I was talking to Rachel about doing an event like to do a neighborhood cleanup that involves, um, you know, that, that involves just getting a brand to help incentivize people to get into volunteerism. It's a fun thing, you know? It, picking up trash can be fun if there's liquor at the end of the tunnel, trust me. I've done it before, it's great. Uh, but something that you have to keep in mind when you're working with brands, when you're trying to, uh, to work with a brand for the first time is brands need ROI. RI is in turn return on investment. So depending on how much the brand puts in, they need to see something in return. It makes sense. It's they, a brand in and of itself is not a charity. So um, each brand has different definitions of what ROI is. Some want to see more social media. Some want to see, um, you know, just more mentions in general. Um, and don't, and if you're new to working with brands, don't be afraid to just straight out ask and say, what are you looking for in a partnership? How can we make this beneficial for you, beneficial for us? Um, having those straightforward conversations helps set expectations and make events and make whatever community engagement that you're trying to get a brand into, it just makes it better and more seamless. So if we go next, yes, being the change. 
You can do it. That was a really bad imitation and I'm not sorry because I don't remember. This is from Waterboy. Again, I'm dating myself with all of these references. I'm realizing like I'm dating myself hard, but that's fine. That's okay. We're going to roll with it. So I wanted to include a few examples of some individuals who saw a lack. They saw an opportunity. They saw a hole in the industry that they wanted to fill somehow. Uh, so if we click, we're going to see a few people. Uh, Rachel Sergi, who I previously mentioned, she started a cocktail competition, DC Cocktail Queen. And before I go to the next one, I will, uh, really briefly, a quick aside, throwing an event, uh, taking ownership in your community, taking ownership of a, a guild or an organization, it really does have a ripple effect. Uh, I won DC Cocktail Queen one year, the next year, Capri Robinson won. And with that win, she took that momentum and that drive and that vote of confidence that she felt. And she created her own competition, Chocolate City's Best, which is not only a fantastic uh, mentorship opportunity and competition, it's a whole weekend of education and um, conversations about equity. And it's, it, it's a really astounding, um, insp inspiring thing uh, or inspiring event and organization that Capri created. Uh, AJ Johnson, Andra Johnson in DC, she started DMV Black Restaurant Week. She saw Restaurant Week, saw that because it was through an organization, it not that not a lot of, uh, you know, or that some Black owners, Black restaurant owners weren't a part of, she wanted to do something that highlighted the Black restaurant owners and their spaces in DC. And so she just create, she manifested DMV Black Restaurant Week. She started Back in Black as well with uh, a few other DC bartenders. Joanna Carpenter and Cameron Shaw started 86 The Barrier because they saw that Spanish speakers who didn't know English as a new language were struggling. They saw that hole and now they've created a really wonderful organization that partners with people and helps bone them up on their English so that they have opportunities to move up and grow. Uh, let me, sorry, I'm squinting here. Of course, we got Ivy, Ivy and Lynette. They started Speed Rack because they weren't seeing female bartenders being celebrated in, uh, in the same way that, that male bartenders were all over the country, you know? They saw a lack, they filled it. And then Lauren Paler, you know, LP right here, and Alex Jump started FOH. All of these people decided that they wanted to see something, that they, there was something missing. And they didn't wait for someone to tell them to do it. They didn't ask permission, as, uh, as someone said earlier. They figured it the hell out and they made it happen. And it's, it's an amazing thing when people take ownership of, in their community because that's when change happens. Um, so we can move forward again. Yeah, it is scary. Okay. <laughs> LP, how are we on time? I can't see. You're doing beautifully. Yeah, where are we at? What time is it? It's 45. Wonderful. Okay, good. So then we can talk about taking ownership of our ourselves and our own growth. Uh, this slide is confusing. I understand that. <laughs> uh, if you click and get to the cocktail name, uh, so the, the next cocktail I'm making is a Blue Train Special. Um, to keep in theme with the other cocktail slides, I wanted to include a lyric, but all of the songs that were called Blue Train are really sad except for the one by John Coltrane, which is all instrumental. So insert trumpet sounds here, Blue Train Special. We're gonna go back to Harry Craddock at the American Bar. Um, and I, I love this cocktail. I, this is one of the first classic cocktails on a menu that I worked 
and um it's just a really happy sexy bubble cocktail which you can't go wrong there uh so what was that I love when people use the word sexy for cocktails. I really, I don't know why. It's just like one of those things that just makes me so happy. I'm like, yes, it is a sexy cocktail. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's okay. We're, we're, we're sex positive. You know, we're, we're not going to sex shame cocktails. They're sexy. That is their right. So I made a, I made a pineapple gum syrup. We're using 10 mils of that, which comes out to, um, I want to say about, uh, it's a, a third of an ounce. It is a third of an ounce. What am I talking about? It's a third of an ounce. And then we're going to do 30 mils or an ounce of Pure Ferrand 1840 Cognac, hence the sexy in the Blue Train special. Um, as a little aside, there is a cocktail called, it, that's also in the Savoy cocktail book called, I think it's just called a Blue Train. And it's a completely different cocktail um that i have never had um i probably will never have because because it calls for a few drops of blue vegetable extract which i don't know what that is i don't need to know what that is I don't you've know. never had a blue vegetable what i mean you know i've i've definitely felt blue while eating vegetables when i was a child like that was a thing but um, otherwise no so yeah, just very simple. 30 mils of cognac, 10 mils of pineapple gum, a quick stir. And again, this is another one that called to be shaken. And I'm just like, Harry, my guy, what, what are we doing? But you know, he did a lot of things right. So I'm, I'm not gonna give too much stuff. Quick stir, using the same strainer because pandemic. And it's great in a champagne flute. I actually also like it in um, like a white wine glass uh, because you know it's a softer cocktail. You're not assailed. Your nose isn't assailed with booze. And then we'll top it with about 90 mils of sparkling wine or three ounces. And you know, when it comes to um, when it comes to champagne cocktails, when it comes to garnishes, I don't know why or any sparkling wine cocktail. I always prefer a curly cue garnish. Um, it's just a personal preference. I just think it looks really cute. So I did a, I just spritzed a lemon thumb over it and gave a little, little cute little curly cue, little curly sue in there. And that is the Blue Train special. Yeah, here we go. Mm. I want that right now. And you're not too far, so I'll be over in 30 minutes. Yeah, girl, I'll see you. <laughs> I'll see you. Someone's, someone's going to help me with all this pineapple gum. I'm not going to drink it myself because I will just be bouncing off the walls. Papa <laughs> and I together will just be vibrating at the same uh, <laughs> at the same frequency, which is not what Fred needs when he gets home. It's not what my partner needs. <laughs> Um, so since the cocktail portion is complete, um, I'm going to go off script, off presentation for a moment. Dude, seriously, if I could bottle this, if I could, if I knew how to bottle bubbles from the convenience of my own home, I would do it. I would send it to you. Uh, but yes, so we're going to go off script a little and I want to talk a bit about, um, about personal ownership. Uh, in a few a few slides earlier, I talked about uh, the effect that taking that first step into um, you know into making should happen. You know, after I did that first fundraiser, the effect that that had on me, and it just really drove me to just move myself forward and um, and see what else I could do. Um, and that's really important. That's why taking that first small step, in my opinion, is the best way to test the waters. So otherwise, it just seem, it can seem really scary. You know, um, I know when I first met Lynette and Ivy, I was like, oh my goodness, these, 
These are these are not human. These are these are amazing, like goddesses from the mountain who have descended to make all of these amazing things happen. And I'm not saying that I don't believe that anymore, but you know, maybe maybe there's goddess in all of us, and we can all do it, and we can all take ownership. Because once you get started, it's not that scary. Um, and something I want to talk about, since this is specifically women and ownership, um, taking ownership of your worth is something that we're starting to talk about, which is amazing, um, and is not necessarily something that comes easily uh, to women because of, you know, because of societal expectations, because of, um, you know, pressures and stigma against women advocating for themselves. Um, when I found out that uh, Mr. Lyon was opening a bar in DC, I had been bartending for almost 10 years and I had been involved in enough in DC and I finally had enough like belief in myself to say, I'm not just gonna apply to be bartender. I wanna, I'm gonna go for a lead bartender. I wanna see if I can do this. I wanna see, you know, what's the worst that can happen? If they say no, then I don't get the job. And it was really scary. I felt, I felt a lot of doubt. I was like, who the fuck am I to be a lead bartender at a lion bar? Who the fuck am I? And you, you know, it's tough, it's scary. It's scary to be vulnerable and put yourself in a position for rejection when every, you know, when everyone else in your life is like, yeah, you can, you can go for it, you can get it. And you still have to fight those demons inside. Um, and so I just, I wish I had like a catch all fix for defeating your inner saboteur, um, but you just have to, there comes a point where you just have to click send to that email uh, where you express interest. Um, I actually ended up reaching out through several channels over the course of a year before the bar even opened, um, right when they announced it. Uh, just immediately reached out because I was like, this is what I want. I don't want to regret waiting too long or not reaching out. And so that was one of the ways that, um, you know, that volunteering and working uh, different seminars. I was a cap at Tales of the Cocktail. It was one of, one of the ways that the, all of those things paid off. One year I met Ryan, um, I met Ryan Shetty in the kitchen at Tales of the Cocktail because I was volunteering and he was there. Um, I didn't think anything would come of it, but we ended up, we ended up working together for a short time last year until the pandemic hit. It was amazing. Um, so I know that this uh, this seminar isn't necessarily as like historical. Sorry, um, isn't necessarily as like historical or fact based. Um, but when it comes to ownership, it really is uh, like taking ownership of your growth. It really is a, per a personal journey. It's different for everyone. And I promise you, if you have put in the work, if you have worked to educate yourself, work to further yourself, if, if you're, if you're trying to, to just make your shit happen, it can happen and it will. It's just a matter of, you know, taking that, taking that step to make it happen. I don't know how helpful that is, but we can probably go back to the slides. <laughs> I've got a couple last slides, uh, so I think we're gonna jump in there. So yes, thank you to uh, FOH, Speedrack, and Maison Caron for, uh, for putting this on, for inviting me on. Um, it's, you know, talk about imposter syndrome. It was very weird to try and come up to try and talk about ownership as a professed non-owner of a bar or a restaurant. So thank you for thinking of me. Um, and then in the last slide, just if anyone uh, wants to catch me online, how about that? 
Uh, my personal Instagram is Bafinal Laureate. You can follow the DC Craft Bar Guild if you are interested or curious about creating an organization in your own community um, or just seeing what you know a scrappy little guild does because we do so we throw some goofy, goofy things. We, we do some bullshit. Um, and if you're interested in uh, following my dog, his Instagram is something to talk about. I'm sure you only saw his tail during uh, during this, but oh, he's playing with his bone now. Good, nice and loud. But yeah, that's what I've got. I don't know if there's any questions, LP, that have come in. Not yet, but I I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. I think everything you said is so true. Um, sometimes I think we need someone to kind of state them to make them a little bit more tangible as as like awkward and weird as that sounds. So I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to chat with everyone. Absolutely.